something on the lens there. Let's talk cinema cameras for a minute, guys. Is there a point to cinema cameras in 2021? Like, is there actually any reason to own a camera that cost as much as something like this? Tens and tens of thousands of dollars. A Red Monstro 8K. Over here, you got a Canon C500 Mark II. Do you even need it? Got my notebook here. I wrote down a few points that I wanted to share with you guys. Cinema cameras have been coming up a lot lately and I wanted to talk about them because I've been going through a lot of my equipment, everything. I've been inventorying my life and I've come to the crossroads. What do I need? What do I need to keep? Do I really need these things? I bought these on my own vocation for projects that I wanted to do, that I want to see through. I have reasoning behind these, but in 2021, are those reasons still valid? With what you can get today. Is this something that you even need to aspire to? Is this a dream of yours? Is, does that need to be redirected somewhere else? Because maybe this isn't for you or maybe it is for you and this is exactly the avenue you need to be taking. Let's talk price. I got this all laid out here. Price. You were looking at an 8K full frame Red Monstro camera. The footage out of this camera looks better than pretty much anything I've ever seen. But do you need that? Are you just making YouTube videos? You guys know my thoughts on just being a YouTuber, but can other cameras at 1 20th the cost also get the job done for YouTube, right? Could that money be spent better elsewhere? Could that go into buying more lights? Could that go into buying you an office? Could it go into renting you a space to make videos? Those things. Next is the weight. These things are really, really heavy. All these points sort of amalgamate together into the sphere of cinema cameras. You've got weight, you've got setup time, speed, crew, perception, quality. I like, I never write notes down for a video. I end up usually just doodling. I like to just wing it mostly, but if these are heavy cameras, back to the weight. They're heavy cameras. When you're traveling with them, they're heavy to put into the overhead bins. They're heavy to lug around with you. There are multiple cases, okay? It's not just stick this in your Peter McKinnon everyday backpack. That's not happening with this. You are bringing one flight case for the body. You're bringing a flight case for lenses. You're bringing a flight case for your wireless accessories and your monitor and your wireless follow focus system and then your easy rig. All of those things are coming with you. So that increases the weight. Run and gun becomes less run and gun. Okay, they're heavy cameras and they're, uh, they're quite frankly a pain in the ass to carry around. Setup time. It takes a long time to build out the camera package, okay? You're not just pulling it out of your backpack and turning it on and going. You're putting on the monitor, you're putting on the side handle. If you're gonna fly it on a steady cam, then you're taking the side handle off and you're putting the other handle on so that it can fit. You've got the module on the back, you've got the lens in the front, you've got a map box, because maybe you're using a cinema lens and the diameter's too big for an ND, so you gotta tangerine that thing. There's a whole bunch of factors. You've got V-mount batteries, friction arms screwed in everywhere to hold different types of things like Teradex and, and things that are gonna transmit to someone who's Who's, you know, operating it wirelessly or someone who's just using a director's cam or a director's monitor. There's a lot going on. He's chilling. The other thing is they are slow. They're slow to start. I remember Tom DeLonge coming out of a hotel. I was waiting in the tour bus because I wanted to catch him coming out of the hotel, walking across the parking lot, getting onto the bus. But I only had a limited amount of battery left because these things suck power out of V mounts a lot. So I was waiting, I was conserving my battery power. I saw him come out the revolving door, bam, switched it on. It didn't get to shoot ready where I could actually hit record and start capturing media until he was halfway down the bus. So he'd walked across the parking lot, got onto the bus, walked halfway down, then it came on and I could hit record. Now it looks great and I captured it, but I meant to capture at least 30 plus seconds before that, but the turn on time just takes forever. Things to think about and things that you don't typically think about when you're seeing them online and you're seeing the beautiful footage and how good it looks. You're never thinking about these dumb little details. Next point. Crew. More so this applies to the red, but these types of cameras are, I wanna say like three person cameras. When we were shooting, the mountains won't remember me. You remember the leaves falling down on the Raptor. We had Kirk actually controlling the focus and you had Max actually controlling the movement of the camera and where it was looking. Then you had me actually holding the camera package, moving it through space. So that was three people just to operate one camera. That's a four person shot because he had a holiday in the trees as well. And when you have that set up and that's dialed, it's incredible. It works in perfect harmony. Same thing with the DJI shoot, right? We had Kristoff operating focus and me operating the movement of the camera. 
So when you have a team using a cinema camera or operating a camera package, that's when it's the most frictionless. When you're trying to do everything yourself, it's a whole nother world. We're almost done with these points, then we'll flip things. I wrote down perception because there's a, there's a certain time and if you work for clients and if you've ever done client work, you'll know exactly where I'm going with this. Trust me, you don't buy them for this reason. It's a byproduct of owning something like this. You show up with this on a gimbal and you've got people wirelessly using it and it's, and it's impressive. Clients are pumped. They're like, wow, we got what we paid for before they even see the footage. You could be the worst cinematographer, worst filmmaker, worst storyteller. You could never have even turned on a camera before, but you show up with all of this stuff, you've already impressed the client. They're pumped. But if you just show up with a single mirrorless camera and a DJI gimbal and you're like, let's go, the client is like, oh, that's it? There's you don't have anything else? You're like, no, that's that's all I brought. Oh, okay. The, the confidence level of the client is far less than what it would be if you show up with a crew in a package like this. Now that's just the perception. Sometimes it's a good thing, sometimes it's a bad thing. I'll leave that with you, but that is just uh, something that happens when you have a big camera setup going on. This little chat today that we're having is brought to you by Skillshare. Now you, <laughs> you, have for sure heard about Skillshare. But if you're here and you enjoy learning and you're trying to learn more about photography and video, this is an effective, a very cost-effective way to learn as much as possible. And that just doesn't just span photo and video, it spans all things. It is a massive learning platform that has thousands and thousands of courses. Some of my favorites recently, Marquez Brownlee, did a great course on shooting and scripting and planning videos, threw a little bit of editing in there too. And who doesn't wanna learn from someone like Marquez. I mean, that guy, he's the king. He's the best of what he does. You could hop on with Gary Vee and learn a bunch of strategy when it comes to social media. There is an abundance of knowledge for the taking. Specifically, since you're here looking to learn more about this topic, the first thousand people who click the link in the description right now, so pause, click, one of the first thousand people, you'll get a month free of the premium membership. If you've ever used Skillshare before, do me a favor, let me know below, what was the most random thing you've learned on Skillshare? Skillshare? Was it how to make the best grilled cheese you've ever tasted? Was it how to use devil sticks? Do you remember those? Link in the description. Thanks again Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Back to cinema cameras, okay? <laughs> Just did it, I did it the wrong way. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Flipping to some positives now. Quality with these cameras is, is where they really shine. You're getting the incredible dynamic range. The footage looks so good. Here are five random landscape shots done with the red. It looks insane. A camera like this, shooting doc style stuff, being able to flip all the settings to where you need them to go and one man band, this is exceptional. It's so easy to do. And you have all the options you could possibly need at your fingertips. So it makes that so, so easy. You've got all your mics lined in, XLR mics. You've got your boom mic up top. You're capturing great audio. You're shooting in raw. That's another massive benefit of these cinema cameras is that you're capturing everything raw. You're gonna eat up a ton of space, but they look phenomenal and people use them for a reason. But then let's talk mirrorless. You've got brands like Canon. You've got brands like Sony. You've got brands like Fuji who are pushing the envelope, who are making great cameras. And now we're seeing cinema style features packed into small bodies that everybody can afford. This is absurd. This costs a lot of money. This costs a lot of money. Now mirrorless cameras also cost a lot of money, but a fraction of what cinema cameras cost. So you're telling me now in 2021, I can get cinema style quality out of a mirrorless camera that goes in my backpack with a gimbal that I can strap to the back, a small drone that can pack into that same bag, and I can go into a production and produce something of the highest quality without lugging around all of this. I would say it comes down to customization. With a cinema camera, you can really dive extremely deep and customize every single aspect. Whereas when you get into a mirrorless camera that's doubling as a stills camera and they're packing video features into that, you're not able to control as much. You get what the manufacturer gives you as far as your capabilities and settings when it comes to shooting video. But with cinema cameras, let's say those types of things are more unlocked. So I wouldn't say one is bad and one is good. 
but it really does come down to what you need. I would probably argue in this day and age, I lean more towards the side of not needing a cinema camera. When I look at some of the work that I've done, like the DJI video. Now granted, there were some red shots in there, but the majority was an R5 on a gimbal. And the production quality of that, I was personally very, very happy with. It still took a crew to make that, but we made it with equipment that was very accessible. So when I see something like that, and I think that looks great, and I'm happy with that quality as a creator, I don't need things like this anymore. Now, if I lean towards the other side where I'm finishing this documentary for Angels and Airwaves this year, planning all that right now, FYI, all the flights and stuff, I've shot 50% of it already on red. So now I make the decision, do I try to continue shooting it on this to keep everything the same, or do I switch the kit over to something small and change up the style? But if I want to deliver it, and I want to try to sell it to Netflix or Hulu or Amazon Prime, those places have requirements that most of these cinema cameras meet. So it's the cheap answer of saying it depends on what your plan is. Depends on your budget, depends on your style, depends on your skill, depends on what you want to do with a camera. But I think I would end with in 2021, you are able to capture and create beautiful work, exceptional work with cameras that don't nearly cost what these cost. And when photographers and cinematographers aren't watching that work and it's the general public and it's just just random people who stumble across your videos and want to be entertained and, and want to be inspired. Are they really bothered that you didn't shoot it on a cinema camera? So for me, the period at the end of the sentence is a smaller kit these days. I want to be more mobile. I want to be free. With travel opening back up, I want to be able to move in and out of travel situations easily. I want my setup time to be super fast. I want my capture time to be easy. I don't want my gear to be super heavy. I'm not always working with a crew. I'm mostly working on my own. One other guy sometimes. I don't need to be breaking my back. I don't need to be wirelessly controlling my cameras. Where that's nice and those projects are fun and they come from time to time, Peter McKinnon in 2021 doesn't really need a cinema camera. Cinema cameras in 2021, are they slowly being phased into something different? I wouldn't say phased out, but are they changing into things that are gonna be replacing how they are now? It's interesting stuff. Something I've been thinking about lately and I wanted to share that with you and I'd love to know what you think. So hit me in the comments below. That was a fun little, that was a fun little conversation. I enjoyed that. Hopefully that helps someone out there if you're on the fence about buying a new camera or you're looking to upgrade and you're, you're thinking that this is the only direction to go. Hopefully that gave you some things to consider. Hit the like button if you like this video, smash it. That's something that you're into 2021 style. Subscribe if you aren't already. And, and I will see you in the next video. Oh, I swallowed halfway through that, Kirk. Did you hear me choke there? Recently, we've been starting videos by testing the flexibility of my hand and it is getting real good. That's about as far as I can go. Final x-rays on Monday, that's, that's this week, that's already passed. By the time you see this, I am well on my way to being mended, but no, you don't care about that. No one's, no one's here for that. Chewy, did you hear that, bud? I was like, ah, oh, ah. How many times I've done that? As you were. See you guys in the next video.